In 2015, I came here with my colleagues and we started this research, Talking Houses. Um, we tried to examine, explore the histories of the different buildings in the downtown, the public buildings and also private homes. And of course, we reconstructed the life stories of those people who use these buildings, who live there. Um, and we try to connect the micro level of the local history with the macroscopic narrative of the history of Hungary. As a result of this research, which is a, an interdisciplinary research because in, in music historians, literary uh, researchers, were also involved as social historians. And um, this book came out as a result uh, in last year, after four years of the first, uh, you know, visits to Kursak. Kőszeg entered the European news in 1532, thanks to Hans Holbein, who actually talked about the siege of the castle. Suleiman I, the Ottoman Emperor, wanted to occupy Vienna, and this small castle Kőszeg was in between, or in the road to Vienna. Uh, Miklós Jurisic, who was the Croatian captain of the castle, was able to stop this huge army. The siege lasted for three weeks in August uh, 1532. Uh, the defenders of the castle were able to keep the castle. You have to understand that it was a very small group of people, only a few hundreds of peasants and a few dozens of real soldiers. So after fighting for or defending the place for three weeks, Yurishish made an agreement with the Turks. They, were, they could put the flag on the castle, but physically they never occupied the place. This building was one of the centers of the defensive system of Kőszeg. If you look at the window behind me, you can see it's very small. And the wall looks very old and thick. And the reason is that we are in the old tower of Kőszeg. Most likely it was built originally in the 14th century. And then it survives many, many centuries, a long time period. By the end of the 18th century, the defensive function was not really important anymore for Kőszeg. So instead of being a fortress, it became an intellectual center and an administrative center of the region. And this building was, uh, actually this building needed a new uh, function for itself. So there were many ideas. In the 1820s, people thought, local people thought about turning this building into a theater, but this plan has never been realized. Then it uh, served as a storehouse for the city. It might be the case, it's not entirely sure that it was also a prison for a while. But what we know for sure that after the Second World War in the 1960s, it became a pub. And lately, during the past few years, we use it, I mean our institution, for in important academic events, conferences, lectures, public lectures. And at times we also organize exhibitions at the ground floor.
So, Kursag was the city of scrolls. It has been since the Middle Ages, but now we talk about a little later period, the 17th century. The city was turned to be Protestant uh, once the Reformation was introduced in Europe, suddenly. But then, recatholization was decided by the Habsburg Emperor and the Catholic Church. Uh, they decided that Kursak should be a center of this recatholization, and as we know, religion was spread through education. This building, I think, symbolizes this education of the Catholics because it was established as the center of the Jesuit order in Kursak. Uh, this was turned to be a school in the second half of the 17th century, in 1677, and for 100 years it operated as an important school in the region. The Jesuit period was uh, a founding narrative in Hungarian intellectual life, and also in the intellectual life of the city. Important figures served in the Jesuit order here in Kursak, uh, who were responsible for renewing the Hungarian language, grammar, literature, and they were in power and they operated here until the dissolution of the Jesuit order in 1777, when Joseph II, as an enlightened ruler, decided to renew the Catholic Church. This is a unique building. It was not only under the control of the Jesuits, but also, after the dissolution of the order, under the control of the Pires, which was another order responsible for education. It didn't last this period for long, only for a few decades, and from 1815, uh, the Benedictine order uh, took the role of the leader here, and for more than a hundred years, they controlled uh, education in Kursag. The Benedictines were responsible for a big shift in the history of education here because they renewed uh, the basic teaching positions and roles in the city. The important uh, historical turning point followed after the Second World War when during the communist regime uh, the historical churches were basically forbidden to operate in Hungary so the building was taken from the Benedictines and for long decades it could not serve its basic function or fulfill its basic function and then uh, lately uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies of Kursag uh, took uh, the building and now it's under construction, it's almost finished and hopefully this vivid intellectual life which Kursag enjoyed for hundreds of years uh, will return to this place. This is one of the most unique buildings here at this square. Um, we know about the owners from the beginning of the 18th century, but before we would talk about the other owners of the building, I think it's very important to understand the technique, how it was decorated, I mean the front. It's a very unique technique taken from Italy, uh, and that's the only house in Hungary where they applied. The name is Sgraffito, and it means that uh, the constructor apply different layers, several layers, on the front of the building and uh, they removed, scrapped uh, the top layer and that's how finally it was uh, made against Graffito, the Italian name. And the other thing what you can immediately notice when you are standing in front of the building is a Latin citation. It comes from Apostle Paul's letter to the Rom Romans and um, I think you should try to translate it for yourself. It says non est volentis neque currentis sed miserentis dei uh, which uh, in English you should figure out what it is and perhaps we can discuss very enigmatic message to the tourists in the city. So about the owners, uh, I don't think it makes sense to go into the details. The most important story is that 
love. It was about love. The owners were surgeons and uh, the, well, beyond the, that they shared the profession, they shared illegitimate love stories, uh, one after the other. Uh, well, a pattern was that they were interested in the neighbor's wife. Sometimes they made kids, sometimes just without kids, they had love affairs. So that's what we know for sure. Uh, these days, this is the library of our institution. We have several thousands of books here and the library is under development. So we always buy all the new books and uh, also database for the readers who come here. So you are absolutely welcome to use the library during the summer university. see the name of Jakob Zsigrai here, who died at a very young age, the age of 31, which is unusual even by the standards of the 18th century. Uh, he was a hero. All Hungarian kids are familiar with his name. The reason is that he participated in an uprising against the Habsburg, uh, but otherwise he was an easygoing guy. He spoke seven languages. We already visited the Jesuit uh, uh, order's house. He actually went to that school, so he received a very good training here in Kusek. Uh, and as a young person, he visited Vienna very often, and his, he was very well known for his love life. He, uh, he had many lovers, and uh, he just enjoyed uh, his life and friends. Jakob Zsigrai was executed for uh, participating in a conspiracy against the Habsburgs uh, right after the French Revolution. And uh, this conspiracy was considered as very dangerous, politically speaking, and that's why the main organizers were executed. Later, he became a pretty well-known writer, so uh, once he left Kuseg, he settled down at the Lake of Balaton and he wrote many, many novels, especially for young people. He was very popular as a writer of the youth. This is an ad from the local newspaper Kusag and its environment. An ad which was done by a young Hungary, Hungarian man he was an ex-student, just out of the university, because his father denied to pay off his bills. And he decided to come to Kuseg and open a graphologist office. And he happened to find a place here in this building. The third person I would mention here in this building is a spy. Perhaps the most exotic life story is hers. Her name was Mary Ellison Waters. Uh, she was the wife of the owner of this palace in the 20th century, first half of uh, 20th century. And she spied for uh, the Brits uh, during the Second World War. And uh, at a certain point, she turned to Hungary as a person who smuggled letters, secret letters, when the uh, English Secret Service uh, tried to make connections with the Hungarian opponents of Horthy and Nazi Germany. She was, uh, of course, identified and imprisoned then. She faced the death penalty, but in the last minute, of course, she survived and she was exchanged for another spy who was a Hungarian. After the war, or at the very end of the war, she returned to Kuseg, but then she was arrested by the Russians. So overall, was, her life was not very lucky, but in the end, she was able to return to London and live there a relatively peace, peaceful life uh, for the remaining years.
This palace is very important for us, for people who live in Kursag and for also those who work in the institution, because this belongs to two uh, families, the aristocratic Festetich family and the Cherna. Both families played key role in the history of Kursag. There's a funny picture here. It was taken from Vienna, most likely by a maid of the Chernow family, sometime during the 1870s or 80s. There is a little poem which in German which explains the picture itself. This is a caricature. It's a fun, they are making fun of the Industrial Revolution uh, through an age-old dream. How old women can be turned into young. This is a machine, old women are put into the machine and they come out as beautiful young ladies. It's an uh, irony about the technical revolution. Kursag is well known for her wines and this, this was especially true in the 18th century and before that. So when this palace was renovated in the 1770s, uh, Kursag was uh, in Kursag, uh, vineyards were very famous and the training of the wine was one of the most important uh, activity of the city's inhabitants. This picture, this fresco uh, on the ceiling, seen from the Old Testament. Moses sent his spies to Canaan and uh, they were ordered to detect actually the country or that territory. Uh, they came back, they returned with this huge grape, which of course the message is that Canaan was a very rich country. This is the most important uh, room of the palace. All the walls were very richly decorated. Unfortunately, most of the paintings were repainted during the socialist time period when the whole palace was uh, cut into small pieces and people just used it um, differently from the historical, original historical functions, of course. But in this room you can find a beautiful picture of a bird. This motif is pretty widespread in Kursek, so in different palaces in the downtown you can identify the same exact motif. The plague column was erected at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, actually Kursek was not hit by the plague very badly, but still uh, many people died, but compared to Western Europe, still the plague was not too bad here in this region. After the end of this epidemic, the Catholics decided to erect a column to express that the victory, or as a symbol of the victory over the illness. This behind me is a wonderful building erected in the middle of the 19th century. This is a synagogue, the synagogue of Kursag, uh, closely attached to the community, the Jewish community here in the city. Uh, well, we could begin the, story, begin the story in the Middle Ages, but now I would rather just talk about the last 150 years, roughly. Uh, in 1798, a very important figure representative of the Jewish community of the city was born here in Kursag. His father moved from the neighboring Lakom Park here. He wanted to make a bigger career as a Jewish merchant uh, than it was possible in Lakom Park. That's why he moved to Kursag. Uh, the Jewish community contributed to the civilization and economic development uh, of the city to a great degree in the first half of the 19th century and also in the later period. Philip Shea was responsible for the synagogue. He uh, was able to finance the uh, construction of the building itself and he also 
uh, gave money for other purposes here in Kursag. So the Jewish community and the city in parallel uh, was developing for decades. Uh, without going into the, all the details, the tragic uh, end of this coexistence of the Hungarians, the Germans, the Croats and the Jews here ended during the Second World War, especially after the, the German occupation of the country uh, during the spring of 1944 when the Jews were deported and tragically they were moved to Auschwitz. The last uh, rabbi of Kursag also died in Auschwitz and we know about the details of his family life from his, uh, from his son who came back to the city and visited his father's uh, uh, home, last home here and uh, the remainings of the Jews. Uh, this belongs to them, I mean this uh, wonderful building, hopefully it will be reconstructed soon. Thanks to new technologies, uh, the, our colleagues were able to reconstruct uh, more or less in its original shape. Uh, the interior was repainted very beautifully uh, and now uh, visitors uh, can actually uh, enjoy the interior more or less the same way as it was built in the middle of the 19th century. We continued our project uh, in the next book. This came out uh, uh, this last Christmas uh, in 2021. Uh, this is also um, representative of this series, uh, Talking uh, Cities. And the title is The Citizens of Kursag or Kursag Citizens. So we continued this book. We try to focus on um, uh, uh, people from the 19th century or even earlier times uh, and uh, we actually collected uh, literary representation of the city. We focused uh, in this book again to be multidisciplinary so the book includes uh, literary stories, social history and music as well. Music is very much in the center of our research. Behind me, you can see this beautiful church building erected in the, the very end of the 19th century in new Gothic style, which is a historical style all over the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. This is the symbol of Catholic life in Kursag because for decades the local people collected money to be able to build this church. The community became relatively large and those historical churches which are available in the downtown were not huge enough anymore for a larger community so that's why they decided to invest money into the church which later served as an important center for the Catholics in Kursag. An important priest in the church was Laszlo Székely who started his service right before the Second World War in 1938 and he came into Kursag with big expectations. He expected a Catholic revival and worked on that very hard, but unfortunately the war interrupted this procedure. He left behind a memoir, a combination of a diary and a memoir, from which we can reconstruct how he tried to serve and do his best as a priest for the Catholic people and also the others. After the war, he was still here in Kursag and he had to witness how the communist system destroyed the religious community.
Sándor Szemző built this house and this is very unique for the downtown because this is the only Jugendstil house uh, in Kőszeg, at least in this very small circle. But here behind me you can see his certificate as a young lawyer when he received the university from the King Franz Joseph. Sándor Szemző left the city for Szombathely and then his daughter got married to a Danish Görög, who was a doctor. And he became an important figure at the hospital of Szombathely. And uh, they raised Sándor, the survivor of the Holocaust, who survived the difficult months of 1944 here at Kőszeg. And he actually told his story in his memoirs. I'm just standing in front of this beautiful building, which has a Jugendstil facade. And uh, I would like to translate for you uh, what this table says. In this building, uh, in 1913, August 1913, uh, they opened the first orphanage of the national train system in Hungary. Um, and uh, we know from the history of the building that many kids actually were raised in this building, taught and raised. Uh, in 2000, the facade was renovated, but then the building was not really renewed. Due to the decision of the Hungarian government uh, last year, they decided that they give uh, more than 12 billion forints for the reconstruction of this beautiful building. After the renovation of the former orphanage, MAV orphanage, the, co uh, the building complex and the surrounding green areas, parks, sports fields, parking lots, etc., the Institute of Advanced Studies, together with several Hungarian national and international institutions, plan to develop an internationally renowned knowledge center with a central European focus. Our institution have already, has already uh, uh, investigated much energy into uh, central European studies, so for us it's quite natural to continue this kind of intellectual adventure. So this new uh, knowledge center uh, will include research and development laboratories, lecture halls, and guest rooms. The main objective of IASC is to provide an ideal creative environment for the best domestic and foreign uh, researchers to work in Kurseg and to ensure the infrastructure and technical conditions for scientific life at international level. The last and largest item of the planned highly significant creative city and sustainable region development concept, which goes far beyond the boundaries of Kurseg, thus increasing the research and educational reach of the IASC and the city. The building's grandiose visual design was created by a very well-known Hungarian architect, Ekler Dezsőd. Mm -hmm.